Holy Scripture and the Church by New Hiramartyr Hilarion Choitsky, Archbishop of Vere. Editor's Note The following article was written in 1914 when St. Hilarion was an archimandrite and a professor of the Imperial Moscow Spiritual Academy. Its message is especially pertinent for our times, when there is widespread confusion and ignorance about the true nature of Christ's Church and about the right approach to Holy Scripture. It can provide invaluable help to Orthodox Christians in understanding their faith more deeply, and in defending and giving an account of it when confronted with heterodox, especially Protestant, claims. At the same time, it can serve as a wake-up call to Protestants, who separate the Bible from the Church, as well as to those Orthodox Christian scholars who have been unduly influenced by the modern, higher criticism of the Bible, which originated within German Protestantism, the fallacies of which are profoundly demonstrated by our modern-day Orthodox apologist, St. Hilarion. In the Church, there are no stone tablets with letters inscribed by a divine finger. The Church has the Holy Scriptures, but he who established the Church wrote nothing. Only once, in the Gospel of John, was it said of Christ that he stooped down and wrote something. But even this one time Christ wrote with his finger and on the ground. It may even be that he did not write any words at all, but merely drew with his finger pointing to the ground. And yet the Church has Scripture, which is called by her holy and divine. Christ did not write anything. It seems that if one reflects enough on this fact, one can somewhat understand the very essence of the work of Christ. As a rule, other religious leaders of humanity, founders of various philosophical schools, have written readily and in abundance, and yet Christ wrote nothing at all. Does not this mean that in its essence, the work of Christ has nothing in common with the work of any of the philosophers, teachers, or leading representatives of the intellectual life of mankind? Furthermore, has the Church herself ever viewed her founder as one of the teachers of mankind? Has she ever considered his teachings as the essence of his work? No. With the utmost exertion of her theological strength, the Christian Church has defended as the greatest religious truth that Christ is the only begotten Son of God, one in essence with God the Father, who became incarnate on earth. For that truth, the greatest fathers of the Church labored to the point of blood. They were unbending in the battle for this truth. They did not yield a single inch to their adversaries, literally not even a single iota, which in the Greek language differentiates homo eusion of similar essence from homo eusion coessential. Those who call these men, i.e., Arians, Christians are in great and grievous error, writes St. Athanasius the Great. Thus did this adamant of orthodoxy argue definitively about the impossibility of being a Christian while denying the incarnation of the Son of God who is coessential with God the Father. But was the incarnation of the only begotten Son of God necessary only in order to write a book and entrust it to mankind? Was it absolutely essential for him to be the only begotten Son of God just to write a book? If the Church insisted with such determination on the divine dignity of her founder, then obviously she did not regard writing to be the essence of his work. It was the incarnation of the Son of God that was necessary for the salvation of mankind, and not a book. No book is able, nor could it ever have been able to save mankind. Christ is not the teacher, but precisely the Savior of mankind. It was necessary to regenerate human nature, which had become decayed through sin, and the beginning of this regeneration was laid by the very incarnation of the Son of God, not by his teaching, not by the books of the New Testament. This truth was expressed with the utmost resolve by church theologians as early as the second century. As is well known, beginning in the middle of the second century, 
Marcion and his followers put forward a sharp distinction between the Old and New Testaments. They even taught that the two Testaments originate from different gods. Thus, according to their opinion, the New Testament contains in itself a new teaching which is directly opposed to the teaching of the Old Testament, and therefore abolishes it. But Christ himself, and the apostles, and the church from the very beginning, recognized the Old Testament scripture as authoritative. The teaching of Marcion was immediately met with appropriate rejection by church writers. In the dispute with Marcion, the theologians of the second century showed in detail that the New Testament does not abolish the Old One, On the contrary, the whole of the New Testament is already foretold in the Old. The New Covenant was known and preached by the prophets, writes St. Irenaeus of Lyon. Read with earnest care that gospel which has been conveyed to us by the apostles, and read with earnest care the prophets, and you will find that the whole conduct and all the doctrine and all the sufferings of our Lord were predicted through them. Thus, with regards to teachings, the New Testament does not in essence offer anything completely new. Those inclined to look upon Christ primarily as a teacher would of course be somewhat confused by such arguments and the logical conclusions drawn from them. Nonetheless, the greatest theologian of the second century, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, who according to the words of St. Epiphanius of Cyprus, was anointed with the heavenly favors of the true faith and knowledge, dispels this confusion. He points out that the purpose and the essence of Christ's coming is not in a new teaching. He writes, If a thought of this kind should then suggest itself to you, to say, What new thing, then, did the Lord bring to us by his advent? Know ye that he brought all possible novelty by bringing himself who had been announced. For this very thing was proclaimed beforehand, that a novelty should come to renew and quicken mankind. The renewal of humanity is therefore the fruit of this very advent, the very incarnation of the Son of God. Saint Irenaeus expressed this idea especially clearly in his recently discovered work, Proof of the Apostolic Preaching. Others do not ascribe any significance to the descent of the Son of God and the dispensation of His incarnation, which the apostles proclaimed and the prophets foretold, that by it must be accomplished the perfection of our humanity, and such men should be counted among those who are lacking in faith. Thus, the perfection of our humanity, according to the teaching of St. Irenaeus, must be brought to pass by the dispensation of the incarnation of the Son of God, not by any kind of doctrine, not by the writing of any book. By taking flesh and becoming man, the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, made men partakers of the divine nature. Assuming human nature in the unity of his hypostasis, the Son of God, by taking flesh, became the new Adam, the progenitor of the new humanity. Quote, Beholding him that was in God's image and likeness, fallen through the transgression, Jesus bowed the heavens and came down, and without changing, he took up his dwelling in a virgin womb, that thereby he might fashion corrupt Adam anew. St. Irenaeus says that the Son of the Most High became the Son of Man in order to make man a Son of God. In the new humanity, built upon the foundation of the incarnation of the Son of God, the unity of our human nature, broken by sin, is restored. Christ himself named this new humanity the Church. In chapter 16 of the Gospel of St. Matthew, we read how the Apostle Peter, on behalf of all the Apostles, confessed the truth of the incarnation of the only begotten Son of God. And Christ responded to him, Upon this rock, obviously meaning upon the Incarnation, upon the fact that He is the Son of the living God, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 16 16-18 When Christ parted with and said farewell to His disciples, He promised to send them another Comforter, 
the Holy Spirit, who would instruct them, would guide them into all truth, and who would abide with them forever. This Holy Spirit is continually spoken about in Holy Scripture, that He gives life to the Church, which is the body of Christ. The Spirit of God lives in the members of the Church and guides them. The Holy Spirit is the single source of all the spiritual gifts which are bestowed upon the members of the Church. The Church as a whole, as well as in her individual members, lives, thinks, and progresses unto perfection through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It is solely through each man's bond with the Church that he receives all the means necessary for his moral regeneration. Both Holy Scripture and the mind of the Church compel us to conceive of the meaning and essence of the work of Christ in this way. It is the creating of the Church, the new humanity. Understood in this way, the work of Christ is truly unique. It towers infinitely above every human achievement. Often today, parallels to the teaching of Christ are found in pagan literature, in Buddhism, in the Talmud, in Babylon, and in Egypt. However, for those who see Christ as the incarnate Son of God, any kind of talk about historical influences on Christianity is devoid of any meaning. The essence of the work of Christ is not in his teaching. Thus, it is obvious nonsense and even blasphemy to place Christ in the category of teachers and wise men along with the Buddha, Confucius, Socrates, and others. Christ brought about man's participation in the divine nature. He infused into human nature new powers of grace. He established the church. He sent down the Holy Spirit. None of this could have been done by any wise man, no matter how lofty the truths he preached, no matter how intelligent and great the books he wrote. Our constant Columbus of every already discovered America, as Leo Tolstoy was aptly called by Vladimir Soloviev, wrote in the preface to the Geneva edition of his brief exposition of the gospel, I consider Christianity to be a teaching that gives meaning to life. And thus, it makes absolutely no difference to me whether Jesus Christ was God or not. But the Church has understood that to look at Christianity in this way is to bring it completely to nothing. It is not enough to show man the meaning of life. He must be given strength for life. Man himself must be recreated. Mankind is saved only through the incarnation of the Son of God and through his creation, the Church. The Church's understanding of the work of Christ, indicated above in general outline, should serve as the only starting point for all of our discussion of Holy Scripture. Christ did not write. His coming to earth had nothing at all to do with writing. The essence of His work was neither teaching nor the writing of books, such as a complete course of Christian dogmatics. No, His work was not literary. But if this is so, then what is Holy Scripture? Christ founded the Church. The Church existed even when there was not yet a single book of New Testament Scripture. The books of the New Testament were written by the Apostles later, over the course of more than half a century after the beginning of the historical existence of the Church. In the books written by them, the Apostles left behind testimony of their oral preaching of the Gospel. They wrote for a church already in existence and entrusted their books to the church to serve as perpetual edification. It is evident that the books of Holy Scripture do not constitute the essence of Christianity, since Christianity itself is not a teaching, but a new life, established in mankind by the Holy Spirit on the basis of the incarnation of the Son of God. Thus, it would not be impertinent to say that it is not by Holy Scripture, as a book, that man is saved, but by the grace of the Holy Spirit, who lives in the Church. The Church guides people to perfection. In the Church, there are also other ways, other means to that effect, besides the books of Holy Scripture. St. Irenaeus of Lyon writes, Many nations of those barbarians who believe in Christ have salvation written in their hearts by the Spirit, 
without paper or ink, carefully preserving the ancient tradition. Those who, in the absence of written documents, have believed this faith are barbarians, so far as regards our language, but as regards doctrine, manner, and tenor of life, they are, because of faith, very wise indeed. And they do please God, ordering their conversation in all righteousness, chastity, and wisdom. In order to become a follower of a particular philosophical school, it is necessary to assimilate the philosophical works by the father of that school. But is it sufficient to know the New Testament in order to become a Christian? Would this knowledge be enough for salvation? Certainly not. It is possible to know the entire New Testament by heart. It is possible to know perfectly the entire teaching of the New Testament and still be very, very far from salvation. For salvation it is necessary to be added to the church, just as it is said in the book of Acts that those who were being saved were added to the church. This was when there were no scriptures, but there was the church, and there were those who were being saved. Why was it essential to be added to the church? It is because special grace-bearing power is needed for salvation, and this power can only be possessed by those who participate in the life of the church, in the life of the single and indivisible body of Christ. The grace-filled power of the Holy Spirit acts in the church in many different ways, in the mysteries and rites of the church, in common prayer and mutual love, in church services, and, as the divinely inspired Word of God, it also operates through the books of Holy Scripture. Here we are coming close to the definition of Holy Scripture. The books of Holy Scripture are one of the means in the church through which the grace-filled power of God acts upon people. The Spirit of God gives life only to the body of the church, and therefore Holy Scripture can have meaning and significance only within the church. Flee to the church, and be brought up in her bosom, and be nourished with the Lord's Scriptures. For the church has been planted like a paradise in this world. Therefore, says the Spirit of God, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, that is, eat ye from every scripture of the Lord. Thus, Holy Scripture is one of the manifestations of the common grace-filled life of the Church. Holy Scripture is the property of the Church, precious and priceless, but precisely the Church's property. Holy Scripture cannot be torn away from the overall life of the Church. Only the Church gives meaning to the existence of Scripture. Holy Scripture is not an independent quantity. It cannot be considered a law given to the church that she can fulfill and from which she can deviate. Holy Scripture arose in the midst of the church and for the sake of the church. The church possesses Holy Scripture and uses it for the benefit of her members. Our Orthodox churches, it would seem, graphically preach the significance of Scripture in the church. The Gospel book lies on the altar table with other holy liturgical objects, with the reserved gifts and the pre-sanctified lambs. The apostle is kept together with the other liturgical books. In the ancient church, the gospel book was usually kept inside the skiva philokion, equivalent to our vestry, from which it was only taken out for public reading during the divine services. If Christianity were something like a philosophical school, then at our church meetings we would of course devote ourselves only to studying and interpreting the New Testament, but that is not the case with us. Christianity is not a school, and for us, the reading of Holy Scripture represents only one of the elements of the public divine services. In the deep river of grace-filled church life, Holy Scripture is but one current. Such discussions may appear to be disparaging of Holy Scripture. But who more than Chrysostom has spoken about the benefit and grandeur of Holy Scripture? Was it not he who called the reading of Scripture conversation with God? Was it not for him that divine Scripture was a spiritual garden and a paradise of sweetness? However, we find a highly remarkable discourse 
at the beginning of St. John Chrysostom's commentary on St. Matthew the Evangelist. It would be indeed meet for us, not at all to require the aid of the written word, but to exhibit a life so pure that the grace of the Spirit should be instead of books to our souls, and that as these are inscribed with ink, even so should our hearts be with the Spirit. But, since we have utterly put away from us this grace, come, let us at any rate embrace the second best course. For that the former was better, God hath made manifest, both by his words and by his doings, since unto Noah, and unto Abraham, and unto his offspring, and unto Job, and unto Moses too, he discoursed not by writings, but himself by himself, finding their mind pure. But after the whole people of the Hebrews had fallen into the very pit of wickedness, then and thereafter was a written word, and tablets, and the admonition which is given by these. And this one may perceive was the case, not of the saints in the Old Testament only, but also of those in the New. For neither to the apostles did God give anything in writing, but instead of written words he promised that he would give them the grace of the Spirit. For he, saith our Lord, shall bring all things to your remembrance. John fourteen twenty six, And that thou mayest learn that this was far better, hear what he saith by the prophet. I will make a new covenant with you, putting my laws into their mind, and in their heart I will write them, and they shall be all taught of God. Jeremiah 31, 33, and John 6, 45. And Paul, too, pointing out the same authority, said that they had received a law not in tablets of stone, but in fleshy tablets of the heart. 2 Corinthians 3, 3. But since in process of time they made shipwreck, some with regard to doctrines, others as to life and manners, there was again need that they should be put in remembrance by the written word. Reflect, then, how great an evil it is for us, who ought to live so purely as not even to need written books, but to yield up our hearts as books to the Spirit. Now that we have lost that honor and are come to have need of these, to fail again in duly employing even this second remedy. For if it be a blame to stand in need of written words, and not to have brought down on ourselves the grace of the Spirit, consider how heavy the charge of not choosing to profit even after this assistance, but rather treating what is written with neglect, as if it were cast forth without purpose and at random, and so bringing down upon ourselves our punishment with increase. Here, St. John Chrysostom defends the necessity of studying Holy Scripture, but at the same time he says that if things were the way they should be, we would not need Holy Scripture, that with a pure life, instead of books, grace would serve the soul, and that this path of spiritual enlightenment is higher. God spoke with the patriarchs and the apostles without the assistance of Scripture. The need for Holy Scripture arose when some turned aside from true doctrine and others from purity of life. Scripture is then a second remedy. We even deserve reproach for being in need of Scripture. It is clear, first of all, that St. John Chrysostom does not identify Holy Scripture with Christianity. He calls Scripture an aid, a remedy. It is evident that that religious life can exist apart from Holy Scripture and without Holy Scripture, which is only one of the aids to that life. The life of the soul being saved is nourished by the Divine Spirit, within the Church, of course. It is by the will of the Divine Spirit that, for the instruction of men, He allowed the instrument of Scripture, of books, especially after the soul stopped being able to perceive the direct action of the Spirit. It is highly remarkable that the argument made by St. John Chrysostom is repeated almost word for word by St. Isidore of Pelusium in his letter to Deacon Isidore. In Chrysostom's discourse, St. Isidore saw a sea surpassing an abundance of ideas. Isidore himself was completely delighted by Chrysostom's arguments, 
though he admitted that at first glance they might seem somewhat incredible or even provocative. You may find it hard to believe, writes St. Isidore, but after listening to it carefully with a good deal of thought, you will not only marvel over it, but could even start applauding. And what is it then, that thing which at first seems unlikely, and after a while not only becomes amazing, but worthy of applause too? I will explain to you in a few words this sea which surpasses an abundance of ideas. Then St. Isidore repeats St. John Chrysostom's argument. Finally, the great ascetic and great authority on questions of the spiritual life and salvation, Abba Isaac the Syrian, former bishop of the Christ-loving city of Nineveh, testifies that for a man who is attaining perfection, who is at the higher levels of the contemplative ascetic life, Holy Scripture no longer holds the same significance as it does for people who have not yet attained an advanced state of perfection. Quote, Until man has received the Comforter, he requires the divine scriptures to imprint the memory of good in his heart, to keep his striving for good constantly renewed by continual reading, and to preserve his soul from the subtleties of the ways of sin. For he has not yet acquired the power of the Spirit that drives away that delusion which takes soul-profiting recollections captive and makes a man cold through the distraction of his intellect. When the power of the Spirit has penetrated the noetic powers of the active soul, then in place of the law of the Scriptures, the commandments of the Spirit take root in his heart, and a man is secretly taught by the Spirit and needs no help from sensory matter. For, so long as it is from matter that the heart has its teaching, error and forgetfulness straightway follow the lesson. But when teaching comes from the Spirit, its memory is kept inviolate. Here we can note the idea held in common with Chrysostom, that Scripture is an aid to spiritual life. Reading Scripture renews in the soul its striving for the good, but the life of the soul is not completely encompassed by Scripture. This is a life of grace, and grace is given to the soul certainly not by the book of Holy Scripture, but by the Holy Spirit, sent down upon the Church. These arguments quoted by great fathers of the Church may at first glance appear provocative, but if we ponder them and place them into the general system of the worldview of the Orthodox Church, then it is impossible not to agree that in them there is a sea surpassing an abundance of ideas. Here we are able to see the Church's appraisal of Scripture. These words could be spoken only by people living completely within the Church, who have fully assimilated the religious ideal of the Church, which consists not in new academic teaching, but in a new life of saved humanity, built by the Holy Spirit upon the foundation of the Incarnation of the Son of God. But, without a doubt, in the patristic ideas cited here, there is an appraisal of Scripture to which we are unaccustomed. This appraisal of Scripture is understandable only to those who consciously live purely by the religious ideal. The religious ideal of the Church, the ideal of deification, of which our divine services are full, is, in the contemporary consciousness, the realm of very few.